A Patriot's History of the United States, Chapter 21, Part 8. Riding Reagan's Coattails, the Roaring Nineties. Having run against the worst economy in the last 50 years, and having ridden into office by reminding themselves and George Bush, it's the economy, stupid. The Clinton team knew that, in fact, the industrial and technological growth that had occurred since 1993 was in no small way the result of the Reagan policies they had publicly derided. Despite tax hikes under Bush and Clinton, the incentives created in the Reagan years continued to generate jobs and growth. Clinton had one pro-growth policy, the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, which would lower tariffs between the United States and its two major continental trading partners, Canada and Mexico. But it ran into stiff opposition from Clinton's own party in Congress. Environmentalists, labor unions, and protectionists all lobbied against the bill, and Citizen Perot led the anti-NAFTA crusade to television where he faced Vice President Gore on CNN in a debate over the plan. In Congress, however, the bill was saved only when a large percentage of Republicans in the House voted for it, whereas the Democrats voted in large numbers against it. NAFTA proceeded over the next several years to add large numbers of jobs to the U.S. economy, contrary to the dire predictions of its opponents. More important to the financial markets, after the Republicans gained control of Congress, the message was that, indeed, the era of big government was over, or so it seemed. At any rate, the financial markets reacted. Although Wall Street had crept upward from 1992 to 1994, the Dow Jones flew into the stratosphere, climbing further and faster than the market had at any time since the Great Depression. Individual retirement accounts, IRAs, swelled in value as yuppies, or young urban professionals, entered the stock market in growing numbers through their retirement plans. More Americans than ever held securities and paid attention to the market, not as speculators, but as investors in their retirements and college tuition for their children. Already on the defensive after the Oklahoma City bombing, Republicans nevertheless thought they could rebound by refocusing on the 1995 budget. Gingrich hoped to impose an austere but reasonable spending plan on Clinton, unaware that the president had already determined to use the budget impasse to close all non-essential government services and blame it on the Republicans. Documents later leaked out showing that in the summer, several months before the shutdown occurred, Clinton administration officials had met with leaders of the federal employee unions to ensure that they would side with the White House. When the GOP submitted its plan, Clinton refused to sign the bill and allowed non-essential government services, parks, libraries, citizen assistance bureaus, museums, and all non-critical offices to shut down. The media cooperated fully having already characterized Gingrich as Dr. Seuss's Grinch, with the headline, The Gingrich Who Stole Christmas, portraying the shutdown as a disaster, despite the fact that defense, the IRS, and other essential federal office continued to work. Television talk shows featured laid-off park rangers or private sector entrepreneurs who supplied the government with goods, all of whom suddenly had no income. At the end of a few weeks, the media had convinced the public that the Republicans were to blame. The shell-shocked congressional Republicans did not recover their confidence for years. Portrayals of the Republican House members set new low marks for distortion, deception, and fear-mongering in American politics. But it was effective. After 1995, many Republicans drifted to a more moderate position to avoid incurring the wrath of the Washington Press Corps. Still, Clinton's own polling told him the issue of fiscal responsibility that the GOP had advocated was warmly received in the heartland, and he could not ignore it. Clinton spoke with greater frequency about balancing the budget, 
a phrase uttered mostly by Republicans in the previous 60 years. He admitted that the robust economy had generated such tax revenues that with a modicum of fiscal restraint, the United States could balance the budget in 10 years, or in seven years, or even sooner. Such talk only further accelerated the markets. By the time Clinton left office, the Dow had broken the 11,000 mark, and although it was already in retreat in Clinton's last six months, it produced consistent federal budget surpluses. Yet it would not be completely accurate to ascribe the exceptional economic growth of the 1990s entirely to the tax cuts of the 1980s, or the election of 1994, or to Clinton's support of NAFTA. Powerful economic forces coalesced to contribute to the creation of such fantastic wealth. Computer chips had plummeted at an annual rate of 68% since the 1980s, to the extent that by the year 2000, the price of a bit is close to a millionth of a cent as the billion transistor device, the gigachip, is introduced. A single production line could fabricate 1.6 trillion transistors in 24 hours. And in 1999 alone, 50,000 trillion transistors were produced, providing such a surplus that Americans use them to play solitaire or to keep the interior temperature of Cadillacs at 65 degrees. Equally impressive, in 1999, internet traffic and bandwidth doubled every three months, traveling over fiber cable that carried 8.6 petabytes per second per fiber sheath, or a number equal to the entire internet traffic per month carried in 1995. Indeed, the computer had spread more rapidly in one quarter of the population than any other technology in American history, except the cellular phone, 16 years compared to 13. That remarkable democratization of technology would quickly be eclipsed by yet another computer-related product, the internet, which spread to a quarter of the population in a mere seven years. Naturally, such stunning increases in productivity caused the value of tech companies to soar. Qualcomm, a company few people had ever heard of prior to 1999, saw its shares rise in value by 2,619% in less than two years. Brokerage and finance firms grew so fast, they defied traditional accounting and measurement tools. Employment only doubled in the brokerage business between 1973 to 1987. Yet the number of shares traded daily exploded from 5.7 million to 63.8 million. Although the Bureau of Labor Statistics recorded a 50% drop in productivity costs of computers from 1992 to 1994, in fact, the costs had dropped at a rate closer to 40% per year, and those price declines only accelerated. Astonishingly, Clinton actually sought to interfere with this growth. In 1993, the Clinton Justice Department initiated a campaign against the nation's largest operating systems company, Bill Gates Microsoft, for allegedly bundling its internet browser with its Windows operating system. In May 1998, the department's antitrust division filed suit against Microsoft. 19 states, seeing a new gravy train alongside tobacco litigation, joined the suit. The Justice Department contended that the bundling required customers to buy both products and gave Microsoft an unfair advantage over Netscape and other rival companies. Yet Netscape was the industry leader, and there was no evidence that Microsoft met any of the traditional criteria that defined restraint of trade. For example, Microsoft's prices on its products were falling, and its service was good. There were no barriers to entry into the browser market. Indeed, Netscape dominated that market. But Americans seldom get worked up when the wealthy are targeted by government. And although consumer surveys showed that upward to 90% of Microsoft customers applauded the company, competitors were visceral in their anger toward Gates, who many claimed had stolen others' ideas. Whereas monopoly theory posits that competitors should benefit from litigation against a monopolist, 
exactly the opposite happened with Microsoft. Every time the government advanced in the case, the stocks of virtually all the computer companies, especially Microsoft's main competitors, fell. Each time, Microsoft gained ground. The share values of all Microsoft's competitors rose. Thus, while the federal and state governments engaged in an attack on a major American business in the name of promoting competition, in reality, the market judged that the Microsoft suit was damaging the entire computer industry. An ominous reaction occurred in the wake of the Microsoft antitrust announcement when markets slowed. Then, as the case drew to a conclusion, turned downward. And we'll continue with this section in the next video. Please like, subscribe, leave a comment below. I'd love to hear what you think of the book. Love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.